here for St. Mary's County. I've been helping Charles County out a little bit lately too. Um, but thank you so much, Jonathan, for doing this. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. I've personally been trying to learn more about trees and I know a lot of other people wanna learn more about trees. So this is a great topic. Thank you so much for doing it. Um, just a little introduction to Jonathan. He is an extension forester with the University of Maryland uh, with 30 years of experience in teaching, research, and technical assistance. He's located in Western Maryland at the Research and Education Center near Hagerstown. Uh, he's developed and implemented extension programs in woodland stewardship, woodland steward training, which is like Maryland woodland stewards, invasive species management, wildlife damage management, natural resource income opportunities, handheld GPS, disturbed land restoration using biosolids and hybrid poplar trees, and wood biomass energy production. He is one of the primary authors of the Woods in Your Backyard Guide, first published in 2006 and revised in 2016. And he's authored numerous extension publications, and he also produces a free quarterly newsletter called Branching Out. Um, you can register for it. Uh, at the extension website. Um, so that's an intro to Jonathan. Uh, thank you for uh, going out on a limb, you know, a little tree pun here. For <laughs> I and love a tree pun. Yeah. <laughs> I know this virtual might be uh, new, but yay. Thank you so much. Well, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, so I've, um, done a lot of stuff with uh, tree ID and um, uh, taught a number of dendrology classes. And uh, uh, most of the classes have done have been face-to-face. -face. So, you know, doing a uh, something um, online with uh, winter ID is very challenging. So I've put this together and uh, I can uh, provide the PowerPoint as well in a PDF format. And I will do so um, uh, once we're done. Of course, you'll have the recording. So uh, let me let me share my screen here, and we'll get going. And uh, I'll just uh, ask Stephanie if she can see my my slides. Yeah, that looks great. And also, as a note, um, Jonathan did provide some additional resources for everyone before the webinar. They're posted online on our Master Gardener website. So I'm going to go pull that link and put it into the chat box now, so that you can all have access to those as well. Okay, great. And uh, like HGAC, we have our own website for our woodland stewardship program, as you see there, uh, extension.umd.edu slash woodland. So, you know, let's talk about trees here. Uh, what I've done for this presentation, I've taken a lot of sources, uh, some stuff, my own pictures. I've taken some images online as well as stuff from other presentations. Uh, I'm trying to document it, more of it, uh, you know, with uh, proper credits. Uh, haven't really got that all completed so uh, but citing sources but I want to thank all the contributors uh, to this uh, even though many of them probably don't know it at this point yet uh, which may be a reason actually maybe I should um, hold off on sharing this until I do that um, but but let's talk about ID characteristics uh, you know I've taught so many woodland classes and one of the biggest challenges to people is identifying trees you know how can you manage something that you can't identify <laughs> very tough so Unlike you know a lot of the classes that I have done, when typically we're going out in the summertime or springtime when there's leaves on the trees, um, we're going to be talking more about dominant winter characteristics of buds and bark and uh, and things like that, um, leaf scars, uh, cones and needles, and we'll define some of this stuff. Um, but I'm going to try and give you some uh, ideas of some sources that are out there and things that you can use. Um, talk about some specific groups of species that I think can be somewhat problematic and um, uh, just try to get you going. But at the end of the day, it's going to take some work on your part here to actually exercise some of this. Um, now, there are some great tree ID resources. Uh, we, you know, we had a leaf, leaf uh, the leaf key you see in the middle there was actually developed for 4-H years ago and it's, it's posted on our website. Um, but we've been using the common native trees of Virginia because uh, it's just a great book. Uh, no sense reinventing the wheel. And of course, there's the gold standard for, for Peterson. But again, a lot of these are based on the facts that you have leaves. Now, do understand just because it's winter doesn't mean you don't have leaves. They're just on the ground. Um, so we have to look at some other resources. 
Uh, and this uh, wood book on bark here, you see here is actually uh, given to me by a colleague, Agnes Kometics. Um, uh, and I took some information, some, some material out of this for this presentation. Um, as an old school winter tree ID guide, uh, that's my old original Woody Plants in Winter by Corin Ammons, uh, which is a great resource. But for this type of presentation, it does re it has a great key to it, but it requires a lot of knowing nomenclature and uh, it gets quite tedious. It'd be very difficult to do in a, in a forum like this. But this is actually a great book um, uh, if you want to uh, really get down to the nitty gritty. Um, it can be, it's a quite extensive key. I also posted these resources here, which I'll be using some of this out of this leaf uh, winter tree ID key from the University of Wisconsin, uh, some from uh, the WVU Extension Service. And of course, I, I think there was this little thing put together by UME Master Gardeners as well. Um, so, you know, finding good keys for winter tree ID is just very tough. Uh, it's not as straightforward as leaves, okay? <laughs> Let's say say that. So, um, but I put this up here because, you know, I've worked with a lot of ecologists and others over the years. And, and this whole idea of gestalt, I know this sounds a little weird, but this is kind of a theory evolved in the twenties, the way people perceive the world around them. And this is, to me, has always been really true with, with trees, you know, and when you get in the forest, you know, there's a certain gestalt or a certain, uh, uh, you know, uh, mindset of when you get into a certain area, oh, this is a wetland area. And when you start thinking about tree ID, you start thinking about, oh, there's certain groups of trees or types of trees that I'm going to see in a wetland area. So it sounds a little weird, but it helps simplify, you know, in your mind to a certain extent about the types of patterns of trees and things that you're going to see in certain areas of the woods. So uh, that's as a... Uh, <laughs> as philosophic as I get today, but uh, um, it is something to consider as you get out there. Um, and so when I look at certain trees like red oak, I see, oh, that bark pattern looks like ski trails, you know, and, uh, or I just look at the general general area. So let's, let's first look at bark, okay? Um, this uh, bark book uh, uh, is, um, has an interesting key. Uh, and it divides bark patterns into like seven different types of bark patterns, okay? Um, uh, first is peeling horizontally and curly strips. And what's one of the first things you think about that? You, know, you think about the, a lot of your birch species, okay? Uh, tend to have those types of characteristics. Uh, lenisols, um, and lenisols are really these little uh, openings that allow air exchange in the stem of trees. You see them on the twigs as well. Sometimes they're dots, sometimes they're more diamonds like you'll see in aspen and some of your poplars. Uh, sometimes they're more round, sometimes they're more you know, horizontal like you'll see in cherry and some other things. And these are just where air exchange takes place through the tree. Uh, and those can be quite diagnostic. And um, you know, as we walk through all of this, just remember that it, it, for certain species, they have certain diagnostic characteristics. It's just gonna make them, they're just gonna pop, okay? Um, you say, oh, that's a bitter nut hickory because it, that, that's a hickory and has, has yellow buds. Bam, you don't have to mess with all the bark and all the other stuff. So the, 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 just remember that for a lot of these species, that's kind of the best way to approach it. So let's move on to number three, smooth unbroken bark. And everybody thinks about beech, obviously, but a lot of young trees as well have very smooth unbroken bark as well in some cases. Um, uh, so, you know, um, number four, vertical cracks or seams and otherwise smooth bark. Um, so a lot of young hickories and stuff, a lot of your young oaks are kind of like this. The bark is starting to, 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 to develop and break apart, but when it's very young, it's very smooth. Um, number five, broken into vertical strips. Length is at least three times the width. Um, a lot of your maples and things like this, uh, uh, bread and silver, uh, your uh, sugar maples, um, a lot of have these characteristics. Um, and then you get into uh, broken, broken into scales or plates. Um, you know, scales and plates, you know, black cherry is a very common one here. It has those big types of platy bark. Uh, and, and, but plates as well, especially exfoliating ones. Uh, you get like a sycamore or a London plane, um, 
uh, you know, um, that's very that's very diagnostic for for sycamore, obviously. And then there's a large number of species where you have these intersecting ridges um, uh, in furrows, you know, in different in different different located in different ways. So um, let's look at a couple of examples of each of these, and uh, uh, just to kind of give you a clue to what I'm talking about. So number one, curling horizontally on the left here. And again, river birch is a classic one like this, but a lot of your, you know, your paper birch and, and things like this, uh, even some of your gray birch might be ca characterized as that as, that as well. Um, so, um, you know, very diagnostic for this species for sure. And of course, river birch is gonna be growing in a wetland area typically. Uh, now I realize a lot of you may be identifying trees in a landscape which they're planted. So that takes the site characteristics out of it a lot of times. Um, so let's look at quaking aspen, an example of lenticels are very visible. Uh, a lot of times they're more like a diamond. Um, another one would be like, a, it's like I said, black cherry and uh, some of your birches, uh, like black birch. You have these long horizontal lenticels that you'll see, okay? Um, again, very characteristic. Number three, smooth unbroken bark. Well, everybody thinks about American beech. And of course, I, I don't show any pictures with, with initials in them, but everybody knows there's initial tree. Uh, don't encourage that at all. Um, and then uh, the other one here is uh, uh, vertical cracks or seams and smooth bark, okay? Um, and a lot of your young hickories are like this. Uh, this, is, this is a young pig nut hickory. And um, it just started to develop cracks there or seams, but it's very smooth. And some of your young oaks are like this as well, okay? So, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, how bark changes as you, you know, as these trees mature. Um, number, oops, number, yeah, number five and six, broken vertical strips, lengths three times the width. And again, a lot of your maples are like this. Uh, you know, they're, they're very, um, uh, the length, very long plates uh, or vertical strips compared to something where you have scales or plates, like that's a mature ch black cherry on the right, okay? So, you know, there, there's representative species in each of these groups. Uh, and number five um, would be, actually I had two number fives, another one, uh, which actually shows uh, the same picture actually. Um, and number six, seven, okay, is um, yellow poplar. Um, very represent has kind of white uh, you know, color in the inside the furrows, uh, intertwining ridges and furrows, uh, black oak on the right hand side, uh, which is more blocky. And then, you know, red oaks have, a lot of your oaks have ridges and furrows and your ash, uh, a lot of your, even a lot of your hickories too, as well, some of those as well. So the only reason I mentioned these, these things is it helps you to, come up with the words on how to describe bark, okay? And after a while, you know, you start to see some of these trees start to say, oh, that's a poplar tree. And you combine that with other characteristics and how it grows and, and where it's located. And then you may see some leaves on the ground or you see the buds and things like that. So, but like I said, you know, the, the bark changes on trees. So like you see on the left here, are these two red pictures of a, of, a, of a red maple, okay? Shows that transition in bark between a young red maple on the left-hand side, which has very smooth bark with vertical cracks. So that may be categorized, I think it was in that maybe number, number three group, to old vertical cracks that form multiple layers, um, which would be more like a number five. So the utility of these, of these uh, classes, you know, is, it has value in terms of helping describe what you're seeing, but realize that as time goes on, of course, they're going to change uh, as because typically as the trees grow, the bark starts to, you know, grow it on itself and it starts to develop a rougher, a rougher type pattern, a more developed pattern. Uh, this is another example of young to old bark uh, for red oak. Uh, on the left hand side, a very far left one is a very a young red oak. Uh, it's almost, you know, you got some lenticels you see there. Um, but, uh, uh, and then the ridges start to develop, okay? And uh, on the older trees. And uh, uh, one thing I'll mention later is one thing characteristic of red oak is as you look up, you'll see it has these flattened ridges on it, which kind of look like ski trails. And I have a picture of that later. 
Uh, and you contrast that with silver maple on the right, uh, again, which is again, what's smoother, starting to break into plates uh, in long strips. And that's the more mature species on the right. So that young to old transition. You know, I always say the trees are kind of like people, you know, we start all, you know, nice and smooth like a baby's bottom and uh, we end up a little less smooth as we get older. So um, just to kind of wind this part out, there are certain trees that have real diagnostic, you know, characteristics that kind of makes them stand out. And I just listed a few off the top of my head here. Uh, black oak has this dark blocky bark, but one real characteristic of, of black oak is if you dig in with a little knife into the inner bark, it's orange, okay? And it's very diagnostic. And you can tell that from a red oak, which sometimes they look a lot alike, uh, which has a white inner bark, okay? Uh, Northern red oak, like I said, has flat top bark ridges. They kind of look like ski trails as they go up the tree. Um, uh, American, oh, I see Terry has raised her hand. So I don't know if um, if, if uh, Stephanie yeah, wants to. I can um, I can go ahead and give her permission so she can talk. Sure. All right, Terry. Um, I went ahead and allowed you to unmute yourself. So if you'd like, you can unmute your mic and go ahead and ask your question. Um. Oh, okay. you were unmuted. Okay, there you go. Go ahead. That, that was actually accidental. Gotcha. No problem. However, when you're talking about sugar maples, I notice a lot of sugar maples uh, get this black. I don't know if that's a fungus or what it is on the bark. And I was just curious what that is. And is it uh, detrimental to the tree? Thank you. I, I think that's what it is. I'm, I'm not positive. I'm sure it's some type of a fungus. I don't think it hurts the trees because I see it you know, all the times on sugar maples as well. And, and the plates on sugar maple, the bark on sugar maple, it just has these much bigger, wider plates as it gets older compared to, to red maple and, and silver maple, which tend to be, uh, you know, more, um, uh, not as big and broad. So, okay. Um, we have a couple others with their hands raised. So while we're at it, we can just okay. go for them. Um, Marianne Brodnicki, I'm going to go ahead and give you permission for talking so you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Stephanie. I did that by mistake. Okay, got it. All right. I apologize. <laughs> okay, no so if, given, given that, maybe we'll just move along and do the questions yeah, at the end. Okay. <laughs> I understand how this, you get, you get, you know, you get uh, nervous or whatever, you start there punching buttons on your computer, so. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, American hornbeam is a tree. I don't have pictures of these right here, but you know, it looks like a muscle. And American hornbeam tends to grow in, in, in um, uh, more moist environments. We call it muscle wood is its uh, common name. American beech, smooth gray bark, as we talked about. Chestnut oak is the thickest bark on the oaks. And you're going to find this on more you know, drier sites uh, up on locations. But it has this really deep chestnut color in a lot of the grooves, especially if it's been growing fast. American sycamore, you know, that most people know what a sycamore is, but uh, there's also a London plane, which is also planted. And a London plane is planted in a lot of cities, but the difference is uh, in the, uh, is, especially in the bark, is that the, the exfoliated regions have more of a brown color uh, compared to American sycamore, which is white, okay? And I believe it has two of the dingle balls instead of one, or it's one or the other. But anyway, black cherry. Uh, and this is, these are a couple of, uh, you know, um, uh, smell-based, you know, characteristics. But if you scratch the twigs and maybe the bark as well, you get, it smells like almonds. And black, black birch, you know, the twigs and the bark smells like wintergreen. So anyway, these are just a few things. And so there's certain trees that are just going to give themselves away by the bark. Others, not so much. So let's, um, uh, I was gonna give you a short tutorial on tree ID. We have a video on this, it's like three minutes long, but, and, and it was just to make the point that, um, the, the, you know, the, for identifying leaves, there are certain basic characteristics we're using of, of um, opposite and alternate and the number, compound of simple leaves and things like this. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm not gonna do that. And just say that, you know, a lot of the leaf keys that are out there, uh, the way a lot of people learn trees is with a leaf key, a dichotomous leaf key. And again, there are some of these keys for, uh, for, for buds and uh, twigs as well. I'm going to go through one, but 
the way these keys work, if for those of you who may not be familiar, is a dichotomous key is you start on the left, you identify which of those categories it is, in this case, a one or a two, are the leaves broad or the leaves needle-like, and then you move to that one and you go to the next indentation and you work your way through the main characteristics. Uh, in this case, it's a very simple key, uh, but they basically all work the same. And uh, for most uh, deciduous trees, you're talking about, um, uh, you know, leaves opposite or alternate, are they simple compound leaves? And then you move into the, the shape of the leaf margins. All right. Uh, so, you know, of course, this is great when there's all kinds of nice leaves out there to do use. But again, I used to tell my, a lot of my students in classes I teach, there's a lot of leaves on the ground. So you can still use leaves in the wintertime. Uh, certain species, not so much, you know, like ash and walnut and some of those other ones that, uh, you know, the, the ray, the, um, the stems tend to disintegrate, the leaflets tend to dry up and go away. But, you know, for all your oaks and other species, you can find these, many times they stay on the tree or they they're, just look under the tree on the ground and you can say the same for fruits as well. So uh, just because it's winter doesn't mean there's not leaves and fruits. Uh, look on the ground, there you go. And again, I talked about some basic branching and leaf characteristics, which you know we can't really use in the winter time uh, for many of these species. But again, if you can find the leaves, you can uh, in leaf shapes. Okay, um, but we we really kind of have to look more at twig anatomy. Okay, and this is where it gets a little. You know, you're gonna have to learn some terminology, and most of you probably know this maybe, but you have that terminal bud. That's the bud at the very end. Okay, and you have lateral buds, which are off to the side. Uh, can you see my um, uh, mouse here, my pointer? Yes, we can. Okay, okay, good. So you have, you know, leaf, the leaf, and then you have bud scales. Sometimes in the case of this hickory, uh, they're very, you know, almost kind of loose and separate, but in many cases, they're kind of just very tight over the, over the bud, and that just depends. And of course, then you have your lateral buds, okay? And then what you see here is your leaf scar, okay? And that's where the leaf that just fell off from the previous year. Okay, and inside that leaf scar are bundle scars. And you can think of that as like, you know, the leaf could be kind of, think about take your arm, be a little morbid, but cut your arm off. And those bundle scars would be the arteries, you know, and the, uh, especially the big arteries and maybe some of the veins that were going through the arm, you know, and uh, uh, you see this, and that's basically what those bundle scars are, uh, as they're referred to. Um, and they are characteristic in many cases. Sometimes they're, you know, uh, they're very numerous. Sometimes they have a certain shape, uh, it just depends. And then you, of course you have pith and certain species have a distinctive pith. You know, the one that comes to mind right away is black walnut, which has like a, a black or a dark ch chocolate colored uh, chambered pith, which is very diagnostic. So, uh, and then the other thing is lenticels, okay? That you see right here. Again, and these is where air exchange takes place. and. Um, um, and then the ring of bud scales from the previous year's terminal bud in some cases, so it's very prominent. So these, are, this is the anatomy of a twig. And, and there's a couple other, you know, all leaf, all keys, you know, uh, leaf keys and every, but typically have some type of terminology or some type of graphic that shows this. So, uh, you know, and they use different, more desirous terms, you know, like terminal buds, but then we have imbricate uh, scales and those are overlapping like shingles. So more descriptive words, okay? Um, and in this case, the type of bud, this is a pseudo terminal bud, which is actually a lateral bud located at the apex. So unlike this terminal bud, which is obviously just comes right off the top. Uh, and this would be like a sycamore is characteristic of this. And then you have some ones that are more like valves, you know, valvate scales like this and a yellow poplar and a lot of your olders come to mind. And I, oh, here's the chambered pith right here. And then leaf scars, like we talked about. So that's your, just kind of your introduction to tree uh, or to twee and bug anatomy there. And again, this is just another one. Uh, and this is from the, um, the, the, the Wisconsin publication. So I, in the interest, I'm not gonna um, repeat myself, but, uh, they are all trying to make you clarify so that when you look at these are the things you need to look at when you're looking at a twig. Look at the type of bud. Look at the lenticels, the, uh, the, the leaf scar, and vascular bundles. And in many cases, it's advantageous as well to have a, um, uh, to have a little, um, little magnifier in many cases. Because <laughs> I will tell you, 
I'm getting the age now where I just can't see things that great. So having a little magnifying lens is a, is a great benefit. So um, uh, leaf and twig ID. Let's, this is a, a, a twig, a, a winter tree ID from the University of Wisconsin leaf winter tree ID. And what I was gonna do was just kind of go through this key. It's pretty simple, uh, but again, uh, you might wanna try this key. It wasn't too bad. But you know, I don't know. It has its limitations. But let's let's walk through it. So we had this is this is my, oops, oops. Okay, this is my twig. Okay, so and I'm going to use. I, just, I wanted to point out in case anyone missed it, these resources are available, and yeah. Jane has just reposted the link in the chat box. So if you guys wanted to download these or follow along with them on your own computer, they're available for you. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, so you would have to, you know, print it out probably unless you have two screens, but, um, um, let's just look at this one. Okay. So we have this twig. All right. And one thing you can't really tell is that it's, um, I, I picked a poor picture. This is actually opposite. In other words, this has the leaf scars are opposite. There's one on the other side that exactly looks like this one. Um, so I apologize for that. So this one says to start here, leaf scars are opposite, go to two. Now this particular leaf key has four pages and it kind of pops around a little bit, but let's just assume this says it's alternate. And I use this because I had a close up picture of the, uh, the leaf scar and I have to go to number three. Oops, there it is. Okay, this is the second sheet. I don't see a number three. Okay, so I have to go to the next one. Ah, there's number three. Okay, and it asks you number three, uh, does it have spines? Or is it a twig without spines? Then it says to go to number four. Are the leaf scars are densely clustered around very short peg-like spurs? No, they're not. And the reason I tell you that, look at the leaf scars, they're wide, they're kind of like a smile. It has all these little individual bundle scars in there, a bunch of little tiny ones, it's a little hard to see. And so the leaf scars are, um, scattered, um, oh, oh, it has a terminal, I'm sorry, uh, three, I just figured out, leaf scars are scattered along more or less the elongated twigs, okay? That's what they are, they're associated along the twig. So that says go to five. It says, is there a terminal bud present? Um, I'm going to, I, I apologize. <laughs> I got myself messed up. This was, opposite leaf scars. So I'm supposed to go to number two. Okay, I apologize. <laughs> I got myself mixed up. Vascular leaf scars are very numerous, which they are, and joined in a line. The buds are broadly rounded and the twigs are fairly stout. Terminal bud cone-shaped, terminal bud slightly cone-shaped, terminal bud is rounded. These are all basically different ash species. Uh, this particular one's a white ash, and I will tell you it is very difficult to tell the difference between uh, a green ash from a black, ash, from a white ash. Uh, that's typically the two species we have is white and green ash. So I just use this to show you how simply to use this key, okay? And I have one more. This is an example of uh, alternate branching, okay? Where the leaf scars are alternate. You see you have a terminal bud here, then you have one, one scar here, one bud here, and then one further down. That tells me to go to three. And then these are the choices. The twigs are zigzag, red-armed, and armed with shine, uh, spines. No, they're not. So the twigs are without spines. So I go to four, all right? And then we have two choices. Uh, the leaf scars are densely clustered on short pegs. No, they're not. And the leaf scars are scattered along more or less elongated twigs. Uh, and that's again, what it is. Um, so it says to go to five. Are terminal buds present? Yes, they are. These are all terminal buds up at the end here. Okay. All right. So I pop along back to my, my thing here. Uh, so it says go to six. And it says buds are crowded near the tip of the twig. Yes, they are. And then it gives me a number of choices of different oaks. And I, I, I'm not going to go through all the, the things because it's very, that picture is all a little bit blurry. Uh, this is actually a white oak. Um, 
it's going to be hard for us to figure that out exactly from that picture. But the only reason I run through this um, is to uh, to show you how this key worked. Now, if the buds were not crowded near the tip, I'd go to the next page, I believe. And I'd be down here on the lower left part. It says buds not crowded near the twig. And then I would go on to seven. Are the leaf scars heart shaped? And so on and so forth. And that would take me into another part of the key. So again, this is from Minnesota or Wisconsin. You know, we have most of those species here. So I only put this up there is that I've, because I looked through a number of keys and the one from Core and Ammons is very difficult to use, but you know, this is somewhat easy. There might be some others out there. So you might want to use this as a, as a starting point to help give you some ideas on how to, uh, how to go. All right. So it's that whole dichotomous key. If it's not this, it gives you a couple of choices. You pick one or the other and you move on to the next one. And once you learn some of this terminology, I think you'll be okay. So with that said, um, branching pattern is the first character to check whether you're looking at leaves or at, uh, uh, you know, uh, just twigs in the wintertime. And um, there's very few species that actually trees that have opposite branching. And I used to use this thing called mad cap horse, maples, ashes, dogwoods, viburnums, and horse chestnut. And I used cap because um, uh, the, um, uh, because the viburns and honeysuckles were in the Caprifoliaceae family. And I thank Wanda McLaughlin for correcting me that they've actually changed that. So it's in the family Adoxiaceae. And so I have to change that to mad ad horse, I guess. But the point is, if you see a tree there with opposite branching, and it's a tree or a large shrub like a dogwood, you know, that's, that's going to be a maple or an ash, okay, or a dogwood typically. Now you have some things like black haw viburnum, which might be a, uh, which is a large shrub. We don't have horse chestnut around here. That's more in the Ohio Valley. So that really limits your choices. All of a sudden you've narrowed down the choices to a maple or an ash. Of course, if the tree's dead, <laughs> it's more than likely an ash because of, you know, emerald ash borer. But, um, and of course, dogwood is an understory. It's not a large tree. It just gets to be a, a large shrub. So with that in mind, uh, let's take a look at a couple of trees that have opposite branching, the, the maples and the ashes. And just, just a couple of comparison of bark patterns, all right? So sugar maple on the left tends to have these bigger, broader plates, like I think I said earlier, compared to silver maple and red maple, which has a little different look to it, okay? Uh, I think a stalt, as you, as you might say, okay? Um, again, realizing this changes with age and things like that. But... Uh, some of the differences between the maples are really are really prominent in the buds. And one of the keys is the color of the buds and the color of the stem. So um, sugar maple has brown pointy buds and a brown stem, okay? And that makes it separates it from all the other maples you see out there. So if you have that big platey bark and you're looking at the buds, it has these brown pointy buds, just like you see on the left here, that is uh, very characteristic. And you contrast that with red maple, which tends to have more of a reddish twig, uh, these types of red buds uh, with those imbricate you know, bud scales. Silver maple looks somewhat similar, uh, can look somewhat similar to red maple. So that, that can be a little bit confusing. But the sugar maple pretty much stands out by itself. All right. Um, if we look at two other maples, which are very common, uh, Norway maple. Now, Norway, Norway maple, you know, is not a forest tree. It's, 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 a, it's escaped, you know, into the wild in some places, but typically you're going to find it more like in uh, urban woodlots or uh, along roadsides where it's escaped from, you know, neighboring uh, plant because it's planted, right? But it does reproduce in the wild. So it's, um, uh, that's the case. You see the bark on the left. Uh, so the bark is very different from other maples. But the real distinguishing characteristic for Norway maple is the buds. Uh, it has these big purplish, big large purplish buds. But the real distinguishing characteristic is if you cut the, the twig with a knife or a pair of cutters, it has this white milky, milky sap that comes out. So that's a distinguishing characteristic. And of course, if it's in the landscape, you know, if there's nothing growing under it, it's probably Norway maple because it has a very dense shade. And, and not to get into the leaves, but the leaves look kind of like sugar maple leaves, but, uh, but uh, we're not talking about leaves here. 
And then box elder is also in the maple family. People know it as the poison ivy tree, kind of as leaves of three, um, but it has opposite uh, branching. You know, op the twigs or the, uh, the buds are opposite of each other, but it's real characteristic is it has a green stem. That's a dead giveaway, okay? And where are you gonna find it? You're gonna find it typically in wet areas. Um, uh, wetland areas, lowland areas. You're not going to find a box elder typically on the top of a mountain somewhere. Okay, so those are just a couple of uh, maples. Uh, a couple of the ash species, like I talked about, these are close up of the uh, of the leaf scar, and then you can see all these very n numerous bundle scars in here, like right here. There's just all these little points. Those are all like veins or bundles, you know, of veins such as they are arteries, however you want to look at it. And uh, it's very, you know, very, very prominent in that very prominent bud. The differences between them are hard to tell. A lot of times people say the white ash has more of a, you know, more of a smile in its, uh, in the bud, in the leaf scar compared to green ash. But I will tell you in the wild, they're very difficult to pell apart. Uh, but I will say that green ash is more prominent in uh, wet areas, very wet areas and swampy areas. White ash is, is more of an upland species. So if you're in a, a more upland area, uh, you're probably looking at white ash. And you can look at a more detailed into the differences, but they're, they're a little hard to tell apart. Um, and then of course the bark here. Uh, I don't know if I go too much by that, by the bark, but uh, white ash has this, you know, like interlacing, you know, high, high ridges like this. Uh, I've seen green ash kind of look very similar. So I'm not sure that bark is a great distinguishing characteristic, except to tell that it's an ash. That, it kind of looks a little bit like uh, yellow poplar in some cases, that same type of um, interlaced, uh, raised, you know, furrow bark pattern you see here. Well, let's look at some trees with alternate buds, uh, or leaves. And this is everything else. So your oaks, beech, hickory, aspen, elm, hackberry, you know, you name it. And uh, let's just look at some examples here, kind of point them out to you. Uh, I talked about black walnut, and that's what that chambered pith looks like. Um, and one, the, the way to describe the, 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 the um, bud is, and leaf scar are described in um, black walnut, it's called a monkey face. So you have to kind of imagine that looks like a monkey. You have these three large bundle scars. And of course the fruit uh, is very prominent. Uh, looking for leaves, so this in the winter can be hard because they tend to disintegrate. Um, but it's very characteristic. And uh, a lot of tree ID classes, a lot of people have a hard time telling black walnut from tree of heaven, okay? There is a difference in the leaves. The, uh, the tree of heaven has little little wings on the, on the bottom of the leaflets, okay? The uh, walnut does not, but, but just look at a winter characteristic. This, this is the monkey face of black walnut. And of course, if you cut the twig, it would be a chambered pith. And you contrast that with tree of heaven where, where the bud is barely, uh, you hardly even hardly see the bud. It has a, you know, it has this different shaped leaf scar as well with all these bundles, but the the buds themselves are very uh, almost hidden. Uh, and of course, the other thing is that it stinks, right? If you cut the uh, the tree of heaven uh, twig, it has that stinky smell to it. But uh, these are two twig differences that would help you distinguish between the two. And of course, the tree of heaven has a much smoother bark as well. Uh, let's look at your hickories. This is where a lot of, very, very hard to tell hickories apart in many cases. Uh, shag bark is pretty easy to tell because you get these big exfoliating plates that come off of a mature uh, shag bark, even fairly young. And you have these big prominent buds that come up with these, with these very visible bud scales that kind of exfoliate off as, of the main bud. Um, most of your other hickories have much tighter bark patterns. So that's a distinguishing characteristic compared to shag bark. Um, uh, bitter nut is a dead giveaway, okay? And because it has this sulfur yellow bud, okay? It's a, it's a giveaway. Uh, so that's a distinguishing characteristic there. If you see a, a hickory tree, you see hickory nuts, and you see this type of, this bud, this long, almost like valvate type, a couple of bud scales, you know, overlapping each other, that's a, that's that, um, and there is difference in the in the in the fruits as well. Um, uh, one way to tell the difference is the okay the the shagbark hickory has a really big fruit, 
most people have a very cold time telling me the difference between pig nut and bitter nut hickory. And, uh, and, and, and what, the way to tell is a, because the, the bark tends to look somewhat similar. Um, it's kind of a tight interlacing bark, uh, but the pig nut hickory, there's it's fairly distinguishing with the fruit because it's a much smaller fruit, has a very thin husk to it and has a pear shape to it because, you, um, and then uh, bitter nut hickory is, um, uh, again, is the one that has a sulfur yellow bud. Uh, it has a little bigger fruit, but the one thing you see in the wild is the difference telling the town mocker nut and pig nut because those are the two where the the bark looks very similar, okay? And, uh, and and one way to tell, again, is this, the type of fruit. The pig nut has that pear shape to it. The mocker nut is, is not so much a uh, very more conventional looking nut. Um, but one characteristic is to tell with the mocker nut, the four sutures from the nut, they split almost all the way, uh, but it's hard to remove it from the, from the shell. And for pig nut, you really don't get much splitting of the shell for those that have fallen on the ground. So those are two characteristics, the shape of the fruit, as well as how they break on those suture lines. And if you look in some tree ID guides, you'll, it'll, it'll explain that as well. So these are the two I see you know, more growing side by side each other in the woods. Uh, if it was a, a, a mocker nut hickory or, or a, uh, uh, a butter nut hickory, it'd be more prominent because I could see the buds, the yellow buds. Um, Catalpa. Catalpa is one of the few trees that actually has a world leaf scars. In other words, if you look around, it's not opposite, it's not single, it's actually three of them around each other. And uh, the Catalpa is uh, fairly easy to distinguish. That's what the leaf scars look like. And again, it has that almost hidden bud to it. But of course, the dead giveaway on a large tree is the fruits, uh, you know, the uh, that, we, that we see. And uh, that's going to typically be planted. I don't think it really escapes much into the wild. Um, hackberry is one of those innocuous trees that, you, that people that, what is that tree? It just, you know, it grows a lot uh, up in um, Western Maryland, up like a lot of um, limestone areas, a lot of rock breaks. It's very hardy, uh, can withstand a lot of uh, drought and everything. But it has this kind of like um, uh, warty bark, even at a very young age, like you see here, and it just gets more pronounced as it gets older. So you look at this tree, it's very warty. It has like a, a, a black droop as, 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 as a, uh, a fruit, um, but it also has this, this like pseudo terminal bud, you know, kind of it's a bud that kind of goes off to an angle at the top like that. And it's hairy, okay. So um, you see this mostly, like I said, a lot of drier areas, but not always. Um, but it just, you kind of look at that tree and go, what the heck is that tree? And the, but the bark is, it's, it's very warty and you actually see on the twigs themselves these like quirky um, quirky excrescences that you know um, that kind of come off it looks like cork growing on the on the twig so uh, look out for that one American beach is obvious uh, uh, the smooth bark but also the long narrow uh, cigar like uh, I guess I call them um, uh, buds are very characteristic you can't miss them there's really nothing else out there like them uh, that I see in the woods. So, uh, and also you know, a lot of times I don't have the leaves, but you know, many people know what beech leaves look like. They tend to stay on during the course of the winter. So um, it's relatively easy to see that. Um, sycamore. Uh, sycamore has a bud that's like one scale. It's not like a bunch of different bud scales, it's one. Um, it has the fruit dingle balls that they're called in many cases. And I think the London plane tree has two fruits, I believe. I can't remember, I always forget that. One has two and one has one. That's a diagnostic characteristic. But, but, the, but the distinctive flaky bark, platy bark is very characteristic. And like I said, for those of you who know what a London plane tree is, they're very commonly planted uh, on streets and things like that around the country. Uh, very hardy, uh, but it has more of a yellowish uh, underbark. Okay. And again, it has a two fruits or one fruit. It's different than the sycamore. I, I forget uh, which is which right off the off top of my head. Um, okay, the, uh, the uh, little balls here, spiny balls, very diagnostic for sweet gum. 
It also has this bud, it's kind of a kind of a wet, sticky type bud in many cases. And kind of like a uh, hackberry, it also kind of has these quirky excrescences on the uh, on the trunk as well as on the twigs. So um, it might be confused with that, but not really because the buds are very different. Um, and of course it has these fruits. Uh, it tends to grow very straight and very dense stands. Uh, you'll find it in very wet areas, especially on the Eastern shore, Southern Maryland, uh, growing in pure stands, very dense, uh, very tough, very tight together. And it kind of has this bark, which is like, you know, just kind of like thin strips like this. Um, but uh, that's typically where you're gonna find it, uh, very wet areas. Black locust, the giveaway here, of course, is the thorns on it, not just on the stem, on the twigs, but many cases coming out of the, the bark itself and the fruit pods uh, with the seeds in them, right? <clears throat> a lot of your oaks, to couple, go over a couple oaks here. Um, white oak bark, red oak bark. Uh, you know, one thing about white oak bark, and I'm not sure I have a great picture of it here, but it tends to have this more like, uh, long thin strips like uh, on the bottom part. Once you get part way up, especially when it gets older, it gets these more like plates that kind of peel off. And if you look up a white oak, you kind of see that it, it kind of changes the bark pattern as it goes up higher. And then of course we have um, uh, the, uh, the the red oak, which looks you know very different than that. And and of course the acorns are very diagnostic uh, for for a lot of these species. Um, but let's look at a couple of bark patterns. So this is red oak. This is what I'm talking about, ski patterns. When you look up the tree, you see these flattened ridges. It's very characteristic. Um, so it looks like ski, these like, like ski slopes, if you can imagine that, all right? And black oak, like I said, very dark and blocky, no real pattern to it. And then it has that orange inner bark. And then the chestnut oak, which I said is very thick, very blocky. And if you look, you can't see it too well, but it tends to have this chestnut color deep in those fissures. And uh, the more prominent the, uh, uh, that chestnut color is usually indicative of, uh, of a faster growing, a better, you know, more vigorously growing tree. And of course, chestnut oak, you're gonna find more uh, on drier sites, upland sites, uh, many tastes with black oak as well. There are other oaks, scarlet oak and, uh, you know, uh, pin oak. I didn't mention pin oak. Uh, of course, pin oak is, I didn't, I didn't include that one, but pin oak is planted a lot. Park lots, it's a very hardy tree, but it has very small leaves, very small, very small acorns and uh, very small buds. <laughs> so everything is small about it. But of course it has that distinctive pattern of branches uh, with pin oak. When you get the bottom parts of the, uh, the branches go down like this, where the rest of the tree goes out like this. And uh, what that means is, you know, uh, anybody who's tried to mow their lawn under a pin oak seems to think those branches just seem to kind of, uh, you know, point down <laughs> all the time. So uh, always cutting them back. Uh, but this is a couple of, you know, a couple examples of different types of, um, of, of, of um, acorns. And I don't know if you can identify these, but I can tell you this is a chestnut oak. It, it's very long uh, like this has a very thin cap on it. And then the, red, the Northern Red Oak is very characteristic because it has this, it looks like a wide and broad. It looks like this, the way it's described many times is it looks like a, a Scotchman's cap. And I believe this is a, uh, a black oak in the middle here. And it tends to have a large, you know, kind of rough fuzzy top to it. So acorns can be very, very, uh, very distinctive. Uh, in many cases, they can be hard to find. Because, you know, a lot of the squirrels and the, and the other critters, you know, you chew them up. Um, uh, white oak, black oak, red oak. Okay. <clears throat> um, this is a scarlet oak. Uh, and this is an interesting acorn bec uh, because it has these, one, this is distinctive characteristic. It has these concentric circles on the bottom of the, uh, of the acorn. That's a, that's scarlet oak. And then we have pin oak, which again, does not have that very small fruits. Uh, black cherry, uh, young bark with a big, big prominent lenticels breaks up and more mature. And then you have bugs and twigs, uh, buds and twigs like this kind of pointy, uh, pointy bud on there. 
Um, I'm just, I'm just going to skip through a couple because uh, in the interest of time, we're getting close here. Uh, Redbud uh, has these uh, kind of, you know, angled look to it, the way the branches just kind of go one branch to one way or the other. Okay. Um, and of course, it has characteristic fruits. And it's a, more of a large shrub. Of course, it's not a tree. And purple flowers in the spring, of course. And heart-shaped leaves. <clears throat> Uh, just a couple of things about conifers. Uh, and, and are leaves needle or scale-like? Are the needles in a bundle? Do they grow singly? How many needles in a bundle? And do leaves fall off in the autumn? So I'm just going to give you a few tips on identifying conifers. I found shortcuts that would help you here a little bit. Um, and this is really the this is the cheat sheet. Okay. Um, Pines have clustered needles, okay? And those are those are diagnostic. So the only pine that has five needles to a cluster is white pine. If it's got five, it's white pine, all right? Uh, clusters of three, it could be loblaw pine or pitch pine, okay? And clusters of two is, a, or three, it's typically could be a short leaf pine. And if it's just two, it's going to be Virginia pine. Um, it could be Table Mountain, which is found way up in the mountains or red pine, which is not native, it's, it's planted around here. But so this is kind of a cheat sheet based on the number of needles in the cluster. And I'll give you a couple of examples here, okay? Um, this is a white pine, five needles per bundle. It's actually called the fascicle, has characteristic cones that are long like this. And you can see the bark gets more uh, blocky as it gets older, okay? Uh, three needles, uh, loblaw pine, which is very, you know, native prominent on the Eastern shore in Southern Maryland. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, pitch pine is, 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 is not very common at all. Uh, and the one distinctive feature about pitch pine is this, it actually has epicormic branches in the, in the trunk. In other words, it, 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 it sprouts needles uh, from the trunk. It's the only one of the few species of pine that does that. Uh, so this is tend to you tend to find this down in the, like the pine barrens or some, some other places, but or maybe up in the mountains. I I forget exactly where it's where it's very common, but um, it's not very common. So if you're gonna have three needles per bundle, in many cases it's going to be loblaw pine or it could be a shortleaf pine, which I'll mention here. But if you see, do see a pine that's sprouting needles like this, that's probably a pitch pine. It's one of the few pines that sprout. Remember, hardwoods sprout you know, uh, you know, from a cut stump. Uh, and pitch pine is one of the few pines that actually does sprout a little bit from the stump. Uh, Loblaw and shortleaf. Uh, the shortleaf pine tends to have stronger, it can have three needles per bundle as well, but um, it uh, tends to have shorter needles, has a different shaped cone. You can see the differences in the size of the cones here. Most cases, very little shortleaf pine native around anymore. Most of the pine that's out there is going to be white pine or loblaw pine in many cases, to be honest with you. Um, two needles or, or Virginia pine, a lot of Virginia pine around. Uh, this is a short, uh, early successional species. It tends to grow um, uh, in old fields, especially areas that have been, uh, have poor soils. Uh, after about 30 or 40 years, like you see in the lower right here, the, the sands tend to break up, the trees start falling down, and uh, has very small cones like this, but it has two needles per bundle, diagnostic, okay? And they're kind of short, and they're kind of scrubby looking, okay? That's Virginia pine. <clears throat> uh, just a quick note on spruce and firs. The, the easiest way to tell a spruce from a fir is that spruce needles are four-sided. Put in your finger, twirl it around. If it rolls around, that means it's a spruce, uh, I mean a fir. Uh, the common is, you know, firs are friendly, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, spruce needles. Uh, I got that mixed up, I'm sorry. Forget about where it says firs are friendly, okay. <laughs> uh, spruce needles are four-sided, they roll between your fingers. Fir needles are flat and they don't roll. I don't have time to get into here the difference between different spruces and firs, uh, but that's the general way to tell, to at least get into the general species area. And you can look at some other uh, characteristics to see. And I have a few here. Uh, Norway spruce uh, is widely planted in cemeteries because the real characteristic of Norway spruce is that it has these weeping branches. It's very sad looking. 
And that's why it's a prominent species planted in most, uh, most cemeteries, because it looks sad. Um, so um, just we'll go in, I mean, next time you go to cemetery, look around and you'll see what I mean. And of course there's blue spruce, which has very stout branches, has that bluish color. You know, a lot of your spruces and firs now are being hit with this fungus and a lot of them are thinning out and dying. Not much that can be done about it, um, but uh, it's, it's something that's ongoing. Um, the last thing I'll talk about really is examples of tree form. There are serpent trees that just by their form, you know, and I, this is out of uh, the Peterson guide, um, you know, walnuts, shag bark, white oak has that tends to be branching out, you know, especially if it's more in the open, you know, these can be somewhat diagnostic, somewhat not. Uh, this is what I was talking about with the pin oak. You have these lower branches that tend to angle down like this and the other ones tend to go up very diagnostic. If you look in the winter time, you can see that. And then you combine that with the small acorns and the small buds and everything else. Uh, uh, and they'll survive in the worst of the worst of sites. Um, just a few things about site. Okay. Remember, I'm kind of through describing all the different um, species and going over that, but just remember where is it growing? Okay. Certain trees tend to grow up on the higher, higher elevations, upland locations. And some of those sites are gonna have thinner soils, drier soils compared to those down at the bottom. And certain species are adapted to more, more fertile sites. And that's what this picture shows. You know, when you see a lot of uh, mountain laurel and uh, things like that, and some chestnut oak, you know, and it's rocky, you know, that's where you're gonna find a lot of your chestnut oak and scarlet oak and black oak, things like that some of your hickories. Uh, in contrast, if you look at this picture, those are oak leaves on the top. This is in the fall. Brown, the brown oak leaves are still on the tree. Get down to the bottom, those um, golden leaves, that's yellow poplar. You know, yellow poplar grows on moist, well-drained, fertile sites. And that's what you're gonna find at these lower slope locations. Not, not in wetlands, but you know, well-drained lower slopes. So again, I just say this to, to keep in mind that that gestalt idea, you know, you get into a certain type of forest and you start envision, oh, there's certain mixes of species that grow there. And I would probably find walnut maybe mixed in with uh, down there, those lower locations. And in and, and a lot of these, you know, physiographic regions across the state have certain characteristic types of forests that grow there. The coastal plain, the Piedmont, you climb up into the mountains of the Blue Ridge, and then finally up into the higher elevations of the, of the, of the Allegheny Plateau, uh, you know, certain types of forests exist in each of those areas. You know, up in Garrett County, you're going to find more, you know, black cherry, northern red oak, and sugar maple. And you contrast that with the eastern shore and southern Maryland, where, you know, warmer temperatures, you know, higher water tables, uh, more conducive to growing your wabawi pine forest, sweet gum, things like that. So, you know, just be cognizant of, of this idea of, of site. I uh, just want to clear that. Uh, a couple of final thoughts here for you to consider is that, you know, winter tree ID requires getting out and looking at a lot of twigs and bark. And, you know, you can try and use a key. They, like I said, there's not a, the one I, I used might be helpful. Um, but the idea is to really start looking for distinguishing characteristics of spe specific species uh, that shortcut that identification, you know, uh, for dendrology, when I taught dendrology, I would actually have a, a card for each uh, species. And on that, I would have the description of the tree and the buds and leaves and all that stuff. But I would underline or highlight with a marker those key distinguishing characteristics, which were the giveaway. And that really helps you uh, really narrow things down quite quickly. So um, with that being said, uh, you know, there are some really good online resources these days. Uh, the uh, Virginia Tech Dendrology has a great website. Uh, that's, for, that's for sure. Um, and um, there's these two books I mentioned as well as these resources that were posted. Um, and um, this was shown earlier. So you may wanna look at some of these resources. And this was another one actually, Winter of Tree Finder for identifying deciduous trees in the winter. This was from a group, I can't remember what the group was. Um, but again, uh, Winter Tree Finder, if you Google that, you probably find it. Uh, and that was a, a cost publication. So 
uh, with that being said, uh, I'll um, take questions <laughs> if we have any. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Jonathan. And I'm going to get out of my, uh, I'll leave this up for just a minute and then I'll stop sharing. So. Perfect. Yeah. A lot of great um, thank you comments in the chat box for sure. People are really excited about the presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and start going through the questions. Um, sure. The first one is, is there a way to tell older trees from younger ones in the winter if you're using the bark to ID? Um, well, I think I showed pictures that basically made the point that yeah, there's a way to tell, but I mean, younger, younger trees, the bark is going to look, is going to look different. It's going to be smoother and less broken up uh, than older trees. I think mm -hmm. that's just a generalization. With that in mind, I mean, you have to look at the other characteristics. So I'm not sure exactly maybe how to answer that question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me... um, and then similarly, we had someone ask, um, in the bark book, how do you know what age in years is considered young, mature, and old? Yeah. Um, well, size would be an indication. I think uh, certainly your younger trees are going to be are going to be much smaller um, and smaller in diameter. I always say that age is not directly correlated with size because if it's a, right. a tree that's grown out in the open but but in general yeah i mean certainly i'm talking about a small tree you know like this might be it's going to tend to be young it's not going to it's going to have those younger growth characteristics and then of course as it gets more mature and old it's going to it's going to break up mm -hmm. makes sense um do sugar maple maples grow in southern maryland i thought they needed to have a colder climate yeah, it's, that's a good point. So again, sugar maple is one of those species which you can pick some of it up in uh, uh, northern, like Baltimore County, and go west into Frederick County. Uh, of course, when you get up into uh, Western Maryland, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of sugar maple, but, yeah, but it tends to like cooler climates. Uh, that's for sure. It's not something you find. It's not really something you find on the coastal plain, mm -hmm. and. Uh, as much and then on the eastern shore for sure it's uh yeah okay um, in general i mean in, you know, of course it's planted you know it can be planted and that's, right. that's a different story right and that's a big that's a point to make here is that you know i talk about what grows native in the forest but you know of course a lot of these things are planted and many times yeah. when you do plant trees out in like a landscape and they're more open Got a little frozen there, Jonathan. And they're oh, different there you go. And they... All right, you're back now. Okay. <laughs> you might have to um, turn your. It says video. my connection's unstable. Yeah, you could turn your video off, and that okay. might help. Um, okay. So, a question for you specifically: okay. Do you have two or three favorite trees to forage fruit from? Black walnut is so hard to get into. Two or three. Um, can you hear me f fine now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, so when I'm out foraging for nuts and berries for my dinner, um, I have my favorite things that I look for, but uh, no, no, be, to be be honest. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of people you know, process black walnuts, but it's, it's, it's pretty messy. You know, you gotta crack the shells and, and all this other stuff. Um, um, I do know, actually, we made, um, my wife made a um, red bud jam out of the blossoms last spring. I thought that wow. was good. I'm not sure, you know, of course, acorns, you know, are not really palatable unless they're boiled and, and, and really, uh, you know, processed heavily. Yeah, hickory nuts. I mean, I guess you can use hickory nuts, but I, I, I tend not to collect stuff like that way and, and eat it myself. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Okay, so we have someone who thought they had a wild black cherry, but the bark doesn't look like what you showed. The diameter is about 10 inches, over 50 feet tall. Um, there's black sweet cherry fruit in early June, and the bark is smooth with wrinkly ridges, mostly parallel to the ground. Do you have any ideas about what kind of tree that might be? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think, you know, what I say, um, 
what I would say is that, uh, you know, the best way to handle that is, is would send some pictures if there's something specifically. Um, uh, the, be the best thing is to, to send a picture. But, but again, I think you can look at some other characteristics. I mean, okay, you should give me descriptions, but what about the buds? You know, what kind of leaves? Can you find any leaves on the ground? It looks like they're obviously from that tree. And you could use a conventional uh, leaf guide in some cases. Yep. And if you aren't able to use the key to figure it out, then you can always send your question and photos into HGIC's Ask an Expert service and they'll be able to identify it for you too. There you go. All right, next. I noticed when a I'm tree leaves, again. the but bark is different on the opposite sides. Is that related to it leaning? The bark is different on one side of the tree than the other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't I mean, there's a lot of some reasons could be that that it's more it's leaning in one way or the other. Um, uh, it's hard to say. I, I mean, I think there's just a lot of variation. The other thing is a lot of times trees have been damaged. You know, mm -hmm. there's some tree that fell against it or something happened. And so there's, it's actually scarring and it's overgrowing some scarring. So you get some a different a different type of pattern there. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm sure the growing conditions that it's in probably affect that, too. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, regarding various blights impacting the ash and chestnut, for instance, have there been next gen trees that have been able to evolve and survive such blights? Uh, well, actually, you know, with the ash, emerald ash borer, there is there are there is some ash that's still ex ex living. You know, on especially I see some smaller stems. Most of the mature trees have been been killed, but if you look on the ground, I still see a good bit of you know sapling and. Uh, small regeneration uh, in the woods that um, it still seems to be doing okay. I, you know, the future of all that is kind of up for grabs at this point. We just don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, they've been developing um, some parasitic wasps, wasps to help, kill, you know, to deal with the emerald ash borer um, itself. And some of those have worked, but some of them haven't. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you got to have enough of the emerald ash borer to maintain the populations of the parasites. So, uh, you know, Ohio uh, states to watch for that would probably be Ohio and Michigan, who uh, got the um, emerald ash borer a number of years before we did, and to see what's happening in their forests in some cases would probably be an indication of what's going to maybe happen here. I don't see any any great breakthroughs though. And in terms of American chestnut. You know, the American Chestnut Foundation, you know, there's a lot of plantations around. They're doing a lot of crosses with Chinese chestnut and uh, back crosses. They still don't have anything that's that doesn't get the blight per se or anything that could be considered to be uh, uh, to, to survive. Yeah. I always say the American Chestnut Foundation folks, because we have worked with them before, are yeah. the most optimistic bunch of people I've ever met in my life. <laughs> Because besides all the uh, all the you know the, the I wouldn't say failures but just the discouraging you know and all the work that's been done, which continues and I I, I you know it, it's great that they're doing that um, uh, you know it's, it could be very frustrating I'm sure, but there's a lot of interest of course. Yes, absolutely. Um, the next one is why do the leaves stay so long on the American beech tree? Oh, uh, there's a certain trees, you know, the, the abscission layer, they just uh, tend to hold on longer. You know, a lot of your oaks uh, are the same way, uh, white oak, um, especially, uh, mm -hmm. is, is very, a lot of your white oaks are like that, and, and some of the red oaks as well. Um, why? It's just, it's just the physiology of the tree. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know why. There's some things we just don't, maybe some physiologist who's much more into it knows better than I am sure has to do with some type of chemical thing that uh, the abscission layer that, but mm -hmm. but why one tree does it another I don't know yeah okay next one um do you find that sweet gum and oak look alike they're not sure what kind of oak it is but they have a 30 acre field and can only distinguish the two by the warts on the sweet gum and the leaves remaining on the oak the saplings kind of look the same to them um, well, I would disagree. I think the buds would look very different on the oak. Uh, okay. The oak buds are, are very different. The, the, the uh, sweet gum bud is, in many cases, kind of um, almost like kind of wet or sticky looking. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and sweet gum tends to be, they just grow straight and tall. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, and of course you could look to see if there are any fruits, you know, on the ground. I don't know if they're, if they're large enough to, to produce fruits or leaves, mm-hmm. uh, or if there's any leaves that might be, might, might, might be left on the tree. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, that would be, they just have a different look with the way the bud, if they looked at a chart with the buds on the twig, I think they could tell the difference. Yeah. Okay, next. Should all ghost fruit be removed during winter dormancy? <clears throat> what does that mean by ghost fruit means that fruit that's still on the tree that hasn't fallen off naturally? So. Yes, I'm not sure, but I think so. No, I wouldn't do that. I mean, you know, first of all, it's uh, probably a source of food for wildlife. You know, once fruit falls on the ground, it's pretty much, you know, decomposes uh, or desiccates or goes away. So, um, uh, I mean, if it's still on the tree, it's probably going to have still have some value for, for wildlife, I would think, more value than being, you know, getting lost in the in the, in the the leaf layer and getting soaked by rain and everything else. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, so that is all the questions that we had in the Q&A and in the chat box. So I think we're all set. And just as a reminder for everybody, we will be posting the recording of this on HGIC's YouTube channel. So it will be available for everybody to watch and we will send out an email to follow up with um, all of the resources and the recording and everything. So thank you all so much for joining. Just just one comment. I saw somebody said that it had four sugar maples in in, in Charles County. And and so I wanted to make distinction that in talking about sugar maples necessarily growing natively, I, I don't tend to, I haven't seen a lot in Southern Maryland, but of course, it can be planted and, and grow anywhere pretty much. So yeah. I think that's, oh, that's a, I didn't want to mislead people. Excellent. So um, Jean and Mariah and Jonathan, if you guys want to stay on and